Today, as we continue the series, this is only a test. We're going to talk about the test of endurance that leads to the greatest test of all. And in the context of our reading, we're going to talk about a dreamer. And those of you who have read the scriptures this week, you immediately know what our subject matter is. We're going to talk about Joseph, the dreamer. And I, I started discovering some interesting facts about dreams. And I thought I'd just share these with you. Number one, when you dream, your body is paralyzed. I didn't know that. Number two, eating late can cause nightmares. I didn't know that. Number three, people forget 95 to 99% of their dreams. Number four, researchers don't know why we dream. They only know that we must dream. Number five, we typically have four to six dreams every night. Number six, a typical dream lasts five to 20 minutes. And number seven, the most fascinating fact of all that I've found is simply this. Some of the greatest inventions, stories, and songs originated in dreams. Here's a few examples. The sewing machine was a dream by Elias Howe. He got up, put together his dream, boom, you got the sewing machine. The song Yesterday from the Beatles by Paul McCartney was a dream. He got up and wrote the lyrics to that dream that he had, and it became the song Yesterday. The Theory of Relativity by Albert Einstein was simply a dream that he had. And he wrote down, <sighs> this cracks me up. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was a nightmare, you think? And she got up and wrote her nightmare down. It became the book Frankenstein. Here's another one. The strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde began as a nightmare by Robert Stevenson. God speaks to humanity in dreams, as we saw this past week. He spoke to 14 different people in the scriptures through dreams, through 21 different dreams. So today, as we looked at Joseph the dreamer, I want to talk to you about dreams in the context, not in a literal sense, but in the context of goals, of aspirations, dreams, dreams that you might have. I want to talk to you in that context, realizing that dreams are important and that many of us have them. In this scripture, I discovered that there's basically three types of people in this scripture. There are those who have no dreams. Number two, there are those who have dreams and the dreams are interrupted or abolished. And then number three, there are those who have accomplished their dreams. I don't know where you are with your dreams today, but I do know that God has a specific word to give you, a rhema word, a word that you need to hear. In order for that to happen, you have to open up your heart and open up your spirit to receive that word. So let's pray together, and let's ask God to help us to forget everything that's going on and just focus for the next few minutes on what God has to say to us. Would you pray with me, please? Precious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the power of your word. I pray that you would anoint me with the power of the Holy Spirit to deliver the words that you've placed in my heart for this group of people. And I pray, Father, that you would open up our hearts to receive your word, open up our spirits to receive it. And God, let us be challenged and changed, if necessary, by the power of your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So Joseph was a dreamer. What was his dream? His dream was to rule over people. He had this dream that he was going to rule over his family, that he was going to be used to be a ruler over people. That was his dream. And his dream became a reality when his father Jacob placed him over his brothers to evaluate them and to report on them. Jacob 
favored Joseph and gave him a coat of many colors. And I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, seeing the little flannel graph pictures, I saw Joseph with a little jacket, multicolored jacket. That was not reality. Reality was it was like a mink coat that went all the way to the floor and had sleeves all the way down to the, to the wrist. It reminds me of the episode that I saw from Andy Griffith when B won a mink coat on a game show, and she was so proud of it. It went all the way down to the floor, and she waltzed into the beauty parlor like, hello, ladies. You know, she just waltzed in like this, and they despised her for it because they were jealous because she had a full-length mink coat. This is the same kind of coat that Jacob was given or that Joseph was given by his father, Jacob. Multicolored all the way down. It was a symbol of authority. Jacob placed Joseph over his brothers to check on them and to bring a report back from the field. So can you imagine Jacob coming into the sheep field with this mink coat on, just flowing, this multicolored, fl hello, brothers of another mother. My father has called and has asked me to check on you. His oldest brother was 40. He was 17. They disdained him. They, they despised him. They were jealous of him. And he was living his dream, his dream of being over people, his dream of administrating, his dream of having the authority to oversee people and to just be a blessing. But his dream was disrupted. It was crushed. It was it was interrupted by the, his brother's jealousy. They took him. They started to kill him. They eventually threw him in a pit. After that, they sold him to Ishmaelites, who sold him to Midianites, who sold him to Egyptians. And now his dream of just overseeing people was interrupted and crushed. He finds himself on an auction block, stripped of his clothes, being sold as a slave. Potiphar, an Egyptian leader, bought Joseph. And then God began to fulfill his dream again. His dream was rekindled because Potiphar placed him over his whole household, over all of his servants. Potiphar treated him more like a son than a slave and said, look, anything that I have is yours except for my wife. And so you can have control and manage all that I have. And so once again, he was living the dream. He was living the dream of being the authority and ruling over people and, and things. And so there he was living the dream. But Potiphar's wife had eyes for this 17-year-old boy. So she tempted him. The Bible says on a daily basis. You read it yourself. He was tempted on a daily basis full of 17-year-old hormones being seduced by an older woman, and he passed the test every single day by just saying no. One day she grabs him around the clothes, and she, and she tries to seduce him, and he leaves his clothes in her hand. His dream of ruling over people and being a blessing was once again interrupted and crushed by false accusation. Potiphar threw him in jail. There he was in jail. And the Bible says this in Psalm chapter 5 about Joseph. It says this. He called for a famine on the land of Canaan, cutting off its food supply. Then he sent someone to Egypt ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with fetters and placed his neck in an iron collar until the time came to fulfill his dream the lord tested joseph's character now that helps us preach this whole series doesn't it let's do it one more time shall we god permits test to develop our character and establish our credibility i think i'm the only one preaching here this morning i need you to help me preach that would you all right say it with authority god and in order, there was a late person saying credibility at the end. <laughs> it's awesome. That's, what ex that's exactly what was happening with Joseph. God was establishing his character and his credibility. And he was imprisoned. <laughs> but God 
began to allow his dream to become a reality yet once again. And the warden placed him over all the prisoners. He became the assistant warden. And he gave him authority over all the prisoners. So Joseph was living the dream again. My dream is to have authority over people and rule over people and be a blessing to people. And so now he's living the dream, even in prison, for 13 years. 11 of those years, that's like since 2010. 11 of those years, he's ruling over the prison, helping the warden. And at the 11th year, two of the prisoners have a dream. And Joseph interprets the dream for both of them. He says, look, this is what's going to happen. In three days, you're going to be called to Pharaoh's palace. And Pharaoh is going to restore one of you and kill the other. In three days, that dream became a reality. We pick up in chapter 40 these words. Pharaoh's birthday came three days later, and he prepared a banquet for all his officials and staff. He summoned his chief cupbearer and chief baker to join the other officials. Let me just pause here for a parenthetical. Let me just take you on a little rabbit trail right quick, if you don't mind. This is one of the scriptures that people who are antagonistic against the word say that this can't be the word. This can't be God's word because this is historically inaccurate. These historians said this can't be true because Pharaoh never had birthday parties. I don't know where they get their information of something that happened thousands of years ago. But on the surface, my argument to them would be, look, Moses wrote this. Moses was raised in Pharaoh's house. Moses ought to know if they did birthday parties. That, that's just my, my surface, you know, response. But God, in his incredible sovereignty, allowed the spade of an archaeologist to uncover what you know of as the Rosetta Stone. On the Rosetta Stone, it, it has Egyptian hieroglyphics. And in those Egyptian hieroglyphics, there is a statement made. And I want to read you this. This is from the Rosetta Stone. The final part of the stone gives instructions. This is actually written on the stone. The final part of the stone gives instructions detailing how Pharaoh should be worshipped how his shrine was to be set up, when prayers should be offered, the burning of incense, the days when festivals, such as, and I quote from the Rosetta Stone, the birthday of the God King should be celebrated. So these people who think they are wiser than God come up with these arguments against the Word of God, saying that the Word of God is only man's revelation of God, when in fact it's God's revelation to man. And they say that there can be no truth to this, and then God allows this to be uncovered. Listen, folks, that happens time and time and time again. You can trust this book. This is the Word of the living God. This is God's revelation to man about himself. That's just a little rabbit trail we had to take. I'm sorry about that. I just love, I love it when God proves his word. So then we pick up verse 21. He then restored the chief cupbearer to his former position so that he could again hand Pharaoh his cup. But Pharaoh impaled the chief baker just as Joseph had predicted when he interpreted his dream. Pharaoh's chief cupbearer, however, Forgot all about Joseph, never giving him another thought. So here Joseph is once again living the dream, even in prison, and his dream is interrupted and crushed by being forgotten. Two years later, Pharaoh has a dream. He calls his demonic magicians to try to interpret the dream even though they've been given power from Satan to do such things, God stopped their ears and their mouths and their understanding. They couldn't interpret his dream. And then, and then the cupbearer remembered about Joseph. And we pick up in chapter 41 when he said, look, I was in prison with this guy. He can interpret dreams. So you read it this week. They got Joseph out. They brought him to Pharaoh. In chapter 41, 
He tells, Pharaoh tells him his dream, and Joseph responds and interprets Pharaoh's dream. He says this. Joseph responded, both of Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. God is telling Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. The seven healthy cows and the seven healthy heads of grain both represent seven years of prosperity. The seven thin, scrawny cows that came up later and the seven thins of head of grain, heads of grain withered by the east wind represent seven years of famine. This will happen just as I have described it, for God has revealed to Pharaoh in, a, in advance what he is about to do. Pharaoh says, oh no, what should we do? Joseph, with incredible wisdom and common sense from God, says this, when we have seven wonderful years of plenty, let's just store the extra in places and come up with a distribution plan for when we have seven years of famine. That is an incredible idea, said Pharaoh. And he placed Joseph second in command in all of his kingdom. And in so much that he gave Joseph his own chariot. And he had servants go in front of Joseph saying, bow down to Joseph, bow down to Joseph. And Joseph became second in command and became very successful and finally fulfilled the dream that God had for him to rule over not just his brothers, not just his family, but all of Egypt in that regard, second only to Pharaoh. But his greatest test wasn't the endurance of rejection. And it wasn't the endurance of, of being falsely accused. And it wasn't the endurance of wasting away in prison. His greatest test and your greatest test will not be the test of endurance, but your greatest test will be the test of success. The test of success is very difficult to pass for two reasons. Number one, success diminishes our faith. Sometimes when we're successful, we don't depend on God like we used to. God said in Deuteronomy chapter 8 when he warned Israel, when you get into the land of milk and honey, when you inhabit cities that you did not build, don't you forget those days in the desert when you had manna from me every day. Don't forget the time when I, when I brought water from a rock. Don't forget the time when I allowed your clothes and your shoes to last for 40 years. Don't forget me. And he said, because you have the tendency to have your faith diminished when success comes. And diminished success destroys our character. I'm reminded of Revelation chapter 3 when Jesus wrote a, a, a letter to the church of Laodicea and he says, you say that you're rich, you're successful, you have everything you need. I'm telling you, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. That's what Jesus said to the church of Laodicea. And he said, your character has been diminished so much, it just makes me sick. When I think of you, I just want to throw up. Now, those are some strong words. But that's exactly what happens if we don't pass the test of success. Our faith is diminished. Diminished faith affects our character. And when that happens, God is going to send another test. How did Joseph pass the most difficult test of success? Two things. Number one, he remembered to forget. Genesis chapter 40 says this. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh. For he said, God has made me forget all of my troubles and all of my father's household. If we are going to pass the test of success, we've got to put those things that destroyed our dreams in the past. We've got to leave those people behind that hurt us, that was part of that whole process. We've got to move on for the, new, for the future, and we've got to, to live in the moment. We can't use our success to hurt those people who hurt us in the past. We've got to forget that. So he called his son Manasseh. And the way the Hebrew letters, I mean, the way the Hebrew names worked is every time he would call Manasseh, he wouldn't just say Manasseh. It would mean, I forgive and I forget. Come here, I forgive and I forget. I forgive and I forget. Obey your mother. 
Every time he would say the name Manasseh, he would be saying, I forgive and I forget. And Joseph forgave his brothers, and he forgave Potiphar's wife, and he forgave the prisoners that forgot him. He forgave it all. He forgot it all. He remembered to forget. We need to remember to forget some things, don't we? If your dreams have been interrupted by people, no fault of your own, your dreams have been crushed and you've been hurt, I'm telling you the Lord is saying, remember to forget those things. Move on. Live in the moment. Allow me to restore those dreams and move on from here. Don't live in the past. That's how he was able to pass the test of success. The second thing that he did, not only did he remember to forget He chose not forgetting to remember. That just messes my mind up. I don't know why, but he didn't forget to remember. He named his second son Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. He gave God the glory. He gave God the glory for putting him in position of power. He gave God the glory for fulfilling his dream. He gave God the glory for giving him the wisdom to have an understanding of dreams. He gave God the glory. He did not forget to remember that it was God that gave him success. We've got to remember when we are successful that it is God who gives us success. It's God who opens those doors. It's God who gives us the the wisdom to make the the right relationship and the right decision at the right time. It's God who is to be praised, and all the glory belongs to God. That's how you pass the test. Forget the things that are behind you and remember the things that are in front of you and give God glory. Would you stand with me, please? When I was praying for you this week, the Holy Spirit gave me three specific words to give to three specific types of people here this morning and maybe who are watching online or by broadcast. First of all, there are people who have no dreams. You are the individuals who are listening to this message and you're thinking, I don't have a dream. I don't have a goal. I don't have a purpose. I find myself doing exactly what Joseph's brothers did just existing. The Lord wanted me to tell you, you are not forgotten. You may not be able to identify specific dreams or goals in your life, and you may feel like you're just existing, but it's much bigger than you. God has a dream for you. God has a goal for you, and God is going to fulfill his purpose and his dream for you even though you just exist faithfully we see this in one of joseph's brothers judah judah was among those who voted to kill him judah was among those who voted to to sell him judah in your reading this week was a pretty bad person and what he did to his daughter-in-law Judah didn't have any stated goals. Judah was just existing on a daily basis, just trying to get through the day, just trying to eat a meal at night. But God looked beyond Judah's existence, and he said, I will fulfill my goal and my dream through you. You're just existing. You're just going to work. You're just doing whatever you do. But I have great plans for you, and one of these days, your great, 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 times 28 grandson is named Jesus Christ the lion of the tribe of Judah so Judah you just keep existing Judah you just keep feeding the flock Judah you just keep doing what you do I am God and I am going to fulfill my dream and my purpose in your life in the midst of just being faithful So those of you who don't have this great dream that you're pursuing this great goal that you're you're, that you're pursuing Let me tell you something. Just live in the moment and live faithfully to God because the sovereign God will fulfill his dream and his goals through you. Satan would come up to you in this service and he would say, look, all these other people who are 
who are fighting the test of success, you're not fighting the test of success. All these other people who have had dreams disrupted, you don't even have a dream. You're nobody. When Satan tells you that, you just remind him that God specializes in using nobodies. And that Jesus Christ himself said, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And so I encourage you, those of you who are just existing at the moment, just getting by, just being faithful, God is going to use you and your sphere of influence, and he will fulfill his calling and his purpose for your very existence. Because it doesn't end here. It's in the context of eternity. The second thing I want to say to people whose dreams have been shattered, whose dreams have been interrupted, maybe by rejection, maybe by false accusation, maybe even by imprisonment. Your dreams have been interrupted by depression or maybe by divorce or maybe by disease by death, by despondency, by discouragement. And you've had these dreams and they've been interrupted and crushed because of the things of life. My word to you is that since God has given you that dream and since you are pursuing that dream, don't you be distracted by the dreams of interruption and the dreams of discour and, and the, the discouragement that comes against your dreams. Shake it off. Allow God to restore that dream within you once again. Dare to dream again. Pick up your purpose. Pick up your calling. Pick up that dream again. Dust it off and say, God, restore the dream. Satan has tried to destroy my dream, but I want you to restore my dream. And I'm telling that group of people who have dreams, who are pursuing dreams, and whose dreams have been interrupted, dream on. God is not through with you yet. Keep dreaming. And for those of you who are successful. My word is, why? Why has God allowed you to fulfill your dreams? Why has God favored you above the other brothers and sisters in Christ and that you are now successful in the world's eyes? Is it because he loves you more than anybody else? Is it because you deserve it? Is it because you've worked hard, made good decisions, gone through doors, been wise, frugal? I don't deny that those things bring success, but I'm back to the question, why? Why has God allowed you to be successful? And the answer is that you are blessed to be a blessing. God has blessed you and has fulfilled your dreams through your own discipline, through your own abilities that, were, that was given to you by him to be a blessing. God said to Abraham, I will bless you and you will be a blessing over all the earth for all generations because through you will come the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so for those of you who have experienced the fulfillment of dreams, the fulfillment of goals, and now you are successful, I encourage you to continue to be a blessing that others may be blessed. That is God's call in your life. If I could summarize, those of you who can identify dreams, take courage. Be encouraged. God is going to use you. For those of you who have lost dreams, be encouraged and take courage. God's going to restore those dreams. And for those of you who are successful, take courage. God is going to use you beyond your wildest imagination to be a blessing to this world who need to hear about Jesus Christ. Be encouraged and take courage. God's in control, and he loves you so much. And all the dreams that he has for you are going to come true.
bow your heads with me, would you please? Father, Lord, as we contemplate and as we reflect on the fact that you have given dreams to us and that even though those dreams are disrupted, you will restore those. As we contemplate the fact that we may not have a specific goal in this season of life, but we know that you are using us for your glory in your own way and in your own purpose. And for those who have been successful, I pray that you would open up doors of blessing like never before. In Jesus' name, I've asked the praise team to sing this song. It just kind of re-preaches the message. And as they sing this song, I want you to take courage. Allow God to restore the dream that has been broken and crushed. Allow the Lord to remind you that he loves you in spite of the fact that you are existing in this season. And allow the Lord to speak to you to continue to be a blessing because you're blessed. Let's worship in church.
Jesus. Just bow your head and close your eyes, would you? God has a dream. His dream is to spend eternity with you so that you could be everything that he created you to be throughout eternity, to fulfill the very destiny for which you were born. That's his dream. Jesus Christ, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. His dream is to spend eternity with you. If you haven't made the decision, if you haven't made the decision to accept his free gift of salvation, today is your day of salvation. All you have to do is call upon the name of Jesus and you'll be saved. All you have to do is confess your sins and he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It would be God's dream for you to accept his gift and to choose to spend eternity with him. Father, I thank you, Lord, for these precious people. I thank you, Lord, for every person that's watching online or by broadcast. I pray, Lord, that if there are those who are listening in this room or those who are listening online, on this television set, Lord, that you would speak to them, that you would reiterate the fact that it is your dream, O oh God, to spend eternity with us, and that's why you gave your life through Jesus Christ so that we could be saved. Jesus, if there are those who need to be saved, speak to them. Move on them, Lord. Help them to realize how much you love them. If you want to accept Jesus Christ, all you have to do is call on the name of Jesus and you'll be saved. All you have to do is recognize that you are a sinner born into sin in need of a Savior. Just confess your sins and he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. Just with a simple childlike prayer, just saying, Lord, I tried to do it on my own. I can't be good enough. I need a Savior. Please forgive me. Save me cleanse me from all of my sins and when you pray that simple childlike prayer in faith he writes your name in the Lamb's book of life and all of heaven rejoices according to the Word of God and you just made God's day you just fulfilled his dream because his dream is to spend eternity with you father I thank you for so great a salvation in Jesus name Amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer, let us know so that we can help you grow in, in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and help you along the way and be discipled. Do you love him, church? Would you just say this scripture and then you may be seated for just a moment. Love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another, even so, come Lord Jesus. Thank you so much for tuning in on YouTube. We would love to have you as a subscriber, so please click on that link. Don't forget to share it, like it, and hit the little bell for notifications when we're on next time. God bless you. Thanks again for being here.